Welcome to Tucker Carlson. Tonight on Election Eve, we are hearing word that Donald Trump may make some sort of announcement tonight at a rally in Ohio that he's doing with the Senate candidate, J.D. Vance. Of course, we'll be monitoring that and bringing you news as it happens. But first, not since the men of ancient Athens scratched their preferences on pottery shards. Has a Democratic election been freer or fairer than the one we saw in this country two years ago? That's what you have heard a lot. Joe Biden got more votes than any president ever, 81 million at least, and every single one of those votes was entirely real. There was no cheating of any kind. Every mail-in ballot belonged to a real person who voted just once. No drop box was stuffed. Nobody coached dementia patients in nursing homes to vote the Democratic line. Even Vladimir Putin somehow decided to stay out of that election. Tech oligarch Mark Zuckerberg did get involved. He spent $400 million to control the mechanics of the election. But for the very best reasons, Mark Zuckerberg wanted to keep voters safe from the deadly coronavirus. His reward is in heaven. And above all, in case you were wondering, voting machines around this country recorded the legitimate results with flawless precision. The machines counted each vote cast for each candidate and awarded those votes accordingly. Can you see the software that would prove that happened? Well, no, you can't. As with the body cam footage from Nancy Pelosi's house, you don't have the necessary clearance to see it. But you can know that electronic voting machines are 100% safe and reliable. And that's why government officials have told you again and again that the 2020 election was, quote, the most secure in American history. Believe it. And by the way, if you don't believe it, our advice is to shut the hell up unless you want to be sued into bankruptcy or have the FBI interrupt your breakfast. So that, in summation, is the official media-approved view of our last election. It was perfect. Don't ask questions. So given that, we were a little surprised when we pulled up Politico this morning. Politico is the publication that helps control the rest of the media on behalf of the Biden administration. We were surprised to discover that actually voting machines are not safe at all. Electronic voting machines, Politico told us, are in fact easily hacked and manipulated, which is why real countries like France have banned them and used paper ballots instead. Quote, there are real risks, Politico told us, that hackers could tunnel into voting equipment and other election infrastructure to try to undermine Tuesday's vote. According to Politico, that's entirely possible because many states, quote, use wireless modems to transmit unofficial election night results to their central offices. These modems use telecommunications networks that are vulnerable to hackers and malicious actors could exploit them to tamper with unofficial vote data, corrupt voting machines, or compromise the computers used to tally official results. Huh? Rigged voting machines? Fake vote totals? Underground tunnels to subvert modems? Isn't this the release the Kraken talk? Well, it is. And as of yesterday, it would have been regarded as insane, possibly criminal. It would have been an assault on our democracy. But things have changed. 24 hours before Democrats were expected to lose in the midterm elections, Politico is letting you know that elections are fake. And not just because of rigged electronic voting machines, by the way, there's an even bigger problem. Somehow, despite the best efforts of Google and Facebook, some of Joe Biden's critics have been allowed to speak in public. And that means it's possible that their dangerous opinions may have infected the minds of some confused and mentally enfeebled voters, tricking them into not loving Joe Biden. This is known in the business as misinformation. If left untreated, it can develop into a condition called disinformation. Watch CNN explain the difference. We know there are different kinds of falsehoods out there related to Election Day. Some of them set to go viral on that day. And this is where there's a really important distinction between misinformation and mm. disinformation. Yeah. Misinformation is, you know, people might share false information mistakenly by accident. Uh, disinformation is inf false information that is created to deceive. Disinformation is deliberate. It, it, one of the most so, so, sort of sad phenomenons, right, is in 2016, most of that disinformation came from outside the country. Now, sadly, a lot of it comes uh, deliberately from inside this country. First, we learned that the voting machines are hacked. Woo! And then we learn not only do we have disinformation, but the disinformation is coming from inside the house. It's terrifying. On MSNBC, we learned that communities of color are suffering the most. Where is the black vote for you right now? Because some observers have said it's not as enthusiastic as it was last time around. 
Again, this is a question of who's doing the polling and who's doing the counting. I do not believe it's because of a deep well of enthusiasm for my opponent. We know that black voters are often discounted. And unfortunately, this year, black men have been a very targeted population for misinformation. I think that Stacy is spot on with that. I listen uh, as my kids watch NBA highlights and whatever else they watch on YouTube. I hear the misinformation being piped in. <laughs> Honestly, it's pretty easy to fool black men, says Stacey Abrams, whom we should remind you is not at all a racist. She's just keeping it real. Is Anderson Cooper a racist? Well, we can't say, but he is concerned that there are an awful lot of gullible Mexicans out there. Watch Anderson Cooper. The number of Hispanic eligible voters has increased by nearly 5 million since 2018. But Spanish speaking communities are also being flooded with disinformation and conspiracy theories, much of it through social media. You are sitting in a home where I used to break bread with Republicans who have now been radicalized. For some Latinos here in South Florida, election lies have ruptured friendships and split families. You can see uh, this information in English, and in two or three days, you can see this disinformation with captions in Spanish. One of the challenges of tackling Spanish disinformation is that so much of it is spread on the messaging platform WhatsApp. Messages are encrypted, so fact check labels can't be used like they are on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Now, maybe we're giving him too much credit, but we didn't realize that Anderson Cooper hated Hispanics. We thought he loved them. Yet there he was on the tape we just played you, those damn Mexicans and their conspiracy theories. Which, if you think about it, is itself a kind of conspiracy theory. Anderson Cooper knows, because he's read it on Twitter, that non-white voters are rejecting the Democratic Party in record numbers. But why are they doing that? That's the question. We know they can't be thinking for themselves and drawing their own conclusions like adults. That's impossible. They're not capable of that. So there must be disinformation afoot. That's his conclusion. Of course, Stacey Abrams agrees, and she's no racist. This is what panic looks like. These are people who know they're about to get crushed, and they're desperate to pretend that they're not responsible for it. Voters don't hate us, honestly. That's disinformation. The Guardian newspaper announced today that if we don't eliminate freedom of speech in this country and impose more censorship to fight disinformation, voters might try to opt out of the current utopia, and at that point we'll have civil war. Quote, Judges will be assassinated. Democrats and moderate Republicans will be jailed on bogus charges. Black churches and synagogues will be bombed. Pedestrians will be picked off by snipers in city streets. They printed that. Message, bottom line, Democrats absolutely cannot lose tomorrow's elections. That's their view. This cannot happen. So with that in mind, they're already preparing the rest of us for election theft, which if you don't want a civil war, you shouldn't complain about, you should just passively accept. ABC News posted a story tonight letting us know that a, quote, red mirage or an artificial GOP vote lead will likely reoccur on Tuesday. Early election night results might not indicate final tallies, and that's okay. In other words, to our readers, says ABC News, don't worry, John Fetterman's going to win. So with that in mind, since they've already said what they plan to do, how are Republicans planning to respond to this? Harmeet Dillon is the chairwoman of the Republican National Lawyers Association. She joins us tonight. I, I can't imagine a more sinister combination of ruthlessness and hysteria that we're seeing. And I, that's not an overstatement, by the way. Uh, on the left tonight, you know there are going to be efforts to, to tamper with the results or to, at the very least, fight over the results. How are Republicans in the states going to respond? Well, thank you, Tucker. I'm happy to report that Republicans are better poised than at any time in my lifetime to watch what's happening tomorrow and to take legal action quickly. In fact, we've already been doing that for the last couple of years. The Republican National Committee in this election cycle has deployed 38 paid election lawyer, senior lawyers in 19 states and another 50 more. And there are hundreds more Republican volunteers and paid staff of campaigns being organized. So every battleground state is saturated with lawyers. I'm here in Arizona and you can't swing a cat without hitting a lawyer. And we are here to make sure that everything is run according to the law, not according to what Democrats make up at the last minute. Now, as you mentioned, Tucker, the Democratic Party is so hysterical about the likely losses tomorrow 
that the Department of Justice announced late today that they're sending lawyers to all the counties where they're thinking that they're going to lose big, including six of the uh, heaviest populated counties here in Arizona. But the Republican National Committee has engaged in almost 80 lawsuits in this cycle. We've won a lot of these lawsuits. I filed many of these lawsuits in multiple states. And so we were under a consent decree, Tucker, for uh, the last 40 years almost that prevented Republican National Committee from engaging in Election Day operations. That lifted. And since we've been able to do it in the Virginia election last year and some other special elections, it's been a success. I'm very confident and voters should be very confident when they go to polls tomorrow that there are lawyers watching the results very carefully and prepared to run into court all over the country if necessary and not let Democrats get away with their efforts to misinform the public and interfere with the results of the election tomorrow. Harmeet Dillon, joining us tonight from Arizona. Thanks so much for that. So you just heard, because we played you the clip, Anderson Cooper on CNN saying, well, it looks like a lot of Hispanics, Latinos, are voting Republican in this cycle, but that's just because they've been brainwashed by conspiracy theories and disinformation. There's probably no county in America more symbolically important to the Democratic Party than Miami-Dade in Florida, South Florida. New polling there indicates that Ron DeSantis, who's running for re-election as governor of the state of Florida, may win Miami-Dade, which is pretty unbelievable. So why? How did Ron DeSantis, who served for one term as governor of Florida, apparently shift Miami-Dade Republican? What is going on here exactly? Not all disinformation, we suspect. Ron DeSantis joins us tonight. Governor, thanks so much. Hey, for, how are you? For, uh, great for coming on. So, you know, these are just polls, but it does seem possible that you will win Miami-Dade. Uh, which wouldn't have seemed possible two years ago. So what exactly is going on here? To what do you attribute? There's clearly been a shift. Why? I think there's a number of factors. I mean, one, I was the governor that was saving their jobs, their businesses, and keeping their kids in school during COVID. The Democratic Party opposed me on every single one of those policies, and they wanted basically indefinite lockdowns and school closures, and that is not good for blue-collar people. Uh, we also have done very strong on crime. When you had the Floyd riots, I immediately called out the National Guard. We were not gonna let that happen in Florida. We are a law and order state, and they know I'm a law and order governor. I think that's important. And then I also think we reflect their values as parents raising kids. We fought Disney to make sure that the kids wouldn't be sexualized in elementary school by keeping things like gender ideology out of the classroom. But yet you, it's the left that wants to put all that in there. So I think you just see Latinos down here, but really blue collar people generally saying we're representing them. We are standing up for them, their jobs, their education, their safety and their families. So I once saw Frank Luntz, who's a famous Republican pollster, tell Republican members of Congress that if they wanted to win Hispanic votes, they had to move left. You're saying you've won those votes by moving right. Absolutely. And in including on immigration. Uh, my first year, we banned sanctuary cities and news media thought that that would be not approved down here. And yet... Hispanic voters in Florida had the highest approval rating for our policy to ban sanctuary cities. We did uh, uh, the transport to Martha's Vineyard and people thought that this was going to be so bad and yet Hispanic voters backed me on doing that because they understand the border is out of control. So I think it's on all of these issues, but clearly the Republican establishment view that you need open borders and amnesty to appeal to Hispanic voters in the United States is dead wrong. It was wrong then, and it's clearly been proven to be wrong now. They've been saying it for 30 years. This is just an amazing experiment in democracy, uh, actually. Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida on the eve of the election, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it's hard to trust polls anymore, obviously, after the last couple of elections, but some pollsters have turned out to be pretty accurate. Craig Kasheshian is a pollster from, well, really a different time. He was Reagan's pollster, actually. And so he's seen a lot of election cycles come and go and has the kind of perspective that you value on the eve of an election. He joins us tonight. Craig, thanks so much for coming on. So I'm not going to embarrass you Thank by asking you. you how many elections you've seen or polled on, but a lot. 
uh, given that perspective, what, where do you think we really are right now? I think, Tucker, and thank you again for having me on tonight, I think we're in the midst of a red surge, maybe not a wave, but certainly a surge that will punish Democrats in power and reward Republicans. But there is a caveat. Um, there is a sacred covenant between the great middle class and our government. And that is that if you keep our streets safe, keep our schools open and our way of life intact, we will send our children to far off battlefields to fight for you. Right. The Democrats right. broke that covenant and they're going to pay a political price for it. Let's hope the Republicans do a lot better than that. What a so, really said, interesting observation. No, but I just want to ask you to pause for a second. So you're watching these recruitment goals fall far short across the armed services for the first time really since post-Vietnam. And you're saying that's the result of this broken covenant. I think so. I think um, the, the middle class, President Trump gave the Republican Party an everlasting gift. He inverted the party from an elite uh, country club, Wall Street type orientation to a great middle class slash entrepreneurial Main Street party. And those folks look to the Republicans for solace and for comfort and for protection. And they have seen the Democrats disappoint them time and time again. That's why you see a shift, a paradigm shift of Latina voters, Asian voters, black Americans yeah. coming our way for the first time in forever. So it's a true monumental shift, and I hope the Republicans don't blow it. But unfortunately, they always miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Let's hope they <laughs> can hold sure. on to it. You've seen 50 yeah. years of it, you know. Uh, Craig, thanks so I much have. for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you. With pleasure. So Donald Trump has shown up in Ohio to support J.D. Vance. There's a big rally tonight. Should be starting soon. There are reports that the former president may make an announcement about his future plans. Obviously, we're going to keep you posted on that. Dr. Mark Siegel, by the way, has been following politics this season. He has an assessment to make about the health of a Senate candidate. Okay, it's John Fetterman. We'll be right back. John Fetterman is a confirmed trustafarian who lived off his parents until, until deep in middle age. His only real job was a symbolic mayoral position in a town called Braddock, Pennsylvania, which he improved not at all. So on the basis of that, he's running for Senate against Mehmet Oz. And of course, Fetterman at this point is not really the candidate. He can't be. He can't even form coherent sentences. In a recent interview with Fox 29 in Philadelphia, he essentially admitted his wife is really the candidate. Watch this. There was a woman right at the end of one of the ads that says uh, that she had supported you in the past, but she thinks maybe it's time to take a step back, take time to heal, and maybe make a run for the Senate in six years. What do you say to that? I, I would just say that I, um, all my doctors believe that, that we're, we're fit to serve and that we are uh, uh, ready to, to serve. So the doctor he's referring to, of course, is a campaign donor who's clearly lying to the rest of us. So we thought it'd be worth talking to an actual doctor, Dr. Mark Siegel, who joins us now to assess the ability of John Fetterman to serve in the U.S. Senate. Dr. Siegel, what, what's your view of that? Well, Tucker, we talked, good evening, we talked about how concerned I am and others are about the impact of this stroke and his comprehension ability and his ability to make decisions and executive function, which he'd have to do daily in office and he'd have to juggle many balls at once. And a lot of us have a lot of concern about that and been calling for his records for transparency, which he hasn't shown. I mean, he's shown some courage, as we've said, but no transparency. But you know what we haven't talked about? We haven't talked about his heart. And there's a lot of info about his heart that's very concerning, Tucker. 2017, his, a real cardiologist saw him, Dr. Ramesh Chandra in Pittsburgh, who said his legs were swollen and his heart was weak, and he put him on medication. And you know what? 
Fetterman did. He didn't show up to another doctor for five years, and he didn't take that medication, which we all would, doctors would all be horrified at. Instead, he had the stroke, and then he went back and saw Dr. Chandra again, and Dr. Chandra got involved, and they put a pacemaker in and a defibrillator in. And Fetterman himself has said that his stroke was due to a blood clot from the heart. That is very significant, Tucker, because a study out of a journal called Stroke, very prominent journal looking at over 6,000 people from Great Britain, have found that if your blood clot comes from the heart, you have about a, less than a 60%, a 60 percent chance, more than a 60 percent chance of either not living five years or having another stroke within those five years. It's greater than 60 percent chance. So I say to the voters of Pennsylvania tonight who are ready to check a box tomorrow, I think before you check a box, you should consider a statistic like that. Greater than 60 percent chance that someone like Fetterman, with a heart in his condition, having had a stroke, will either have a recurrence or won't survive the term. Tucker? It's like, why not just, I mean, this happened in May. They had time to put a real candidate in. It's all so bewildering. Dr. Mark Siegel, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tucker. So Washington State, the city of Seattle, got to be some of the prettiest places on the planet, but they've been destroyed. Tent cities, open air drug markets. Tiffany Smiley is hoping to change that. She's running against Patty Murray for Senate in the state of Washington. She's up against Patty Murray. She appears in the polls to be up. Patty Murray has served five terms. Tiffany Smiley could change that tomorrow. She joins us tonight. Tiffany Smiley, thanks so much for coming on. I mean, this is one of those, we haven't been paying a ton of attention, but if you had said three months ago a Republican could win in Washington state, statewide, that would have seemed impossible. Why do you think this is happening? Well, this is happening because I've been connecting with voters over the last 18 months and connecting on common ground. You know, I have been to the largest homeless encampment in the heart of Seattle. I went there to learn about the roadblocks to getting help and why we are allowing this, why we are allowing individuals to poison themselves in front of our eyes. It's inhumane, yes. it's immoral, and it's wrong. So I went, I was helping clean up needles, dirty needles, um, and do harm re reduction. And there was a woman that was there helping as well. And she came across the camp and she said, Tiffany Smiley. And I sort of laughed because I, here I am in the heart of Seattle. And I said, yeah, I don't know what attack ad you're watching, but I'm really a nice person. I'm here to serve. And she goes, no, no, no. I've always voted Democrat. In fact, I've always voted for Patty Murray. And I'm honored to be voting for you. And it was this real special moment because here, here was a Democrat and Republican. We're standing in the heart of a city where, where we're allowing people to poison themselves to death and we want what's best. That's why we are gaining ground because my message is resonating across the board with Democrats, independents and Republicans. Hundreds of people are coming to my events. We need hope here in Washington state. I yes. have a whole agenda to turn crisis into hope, Tucker. And this, this isn't just about Washington state. This is about our country. This is about the future of our children. Senator Murray just continues the dangerous rhetoric that divides us. I'm here to unify. I mean, we have hundreds of thousands of Americans living on the street. Nobody ever mentions it. Yes. It's the first thing you mentioned. And I mean, if you win on the basis of that, it'll be such a wonderful and affirming thing to see. To see. Yes. Because you're right. Tiffany Smiley, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Tucker. I appreciate it. Well, speaking of a race nobody expected, the Arizona governor's race, Carrie Lake, comes out of nowhere to become one of the most famous Republicans in the country. Then the FBI and bomb squad show up at her campaign offices, and it's impossible to find out exactly what that's about. Carrie Lake joins us next to explain exactly what that was about. We'll be right back. In the greatest clip ever recorded in the history of cable news, Joy Reid of MSNBC explained the other day that voters are upset about inflation because Republicans taught them the word. They didn't know the word inflation, but Republicans taught them that. Taught them to be upset about it. But actually, according to people who know what they're talking about, inflation really is real. It's higher than it's been in nearly 40 years. How high is it? And what effect will that have in the elections tomorrow? Charlie Gasparino is a Fox Business senior correspondent. He's been covering this topic. He joins us tonight. Charlie, I, I, I assume you believe inflation's real. How real is it? Yeah. Yeah, inflation's real. I get it. Uh, the sun's coming out tomorrow. I mean, here's the thing, Tucker. Um, you know, it, this whole notion that inflation isn't real, it's made up, really gives lie to the notion that the... Uh, 
that the Democrats are the party of the working class. I mean, inflation yeah. is really bad. You know, my mother-in-law out in Queens, you know, in one week, Groceries go up 20 bucks. I mean, good thing we're there for her. But, you know, a lot of people on fixed incomes aren't there, don't have that backup. And it's, it's a pernicious tax on the working and middle class. Yes. And it gives, gives lie to the notion that this administration, the Democrats, care about them. Listen, they may care about the rich who can make money in the stock market while prices are going up. They may care about the poor, give them transfer payments. But they don't care about the middle class, the working class. And this is a big tax on them. And it's probably going to cost them tomorrow. And I think if you look at one issue that drives people crazy when they're when they're working class people in particular, it's when they can't fill up their tank of gas. They have they can't buy steak. They have to eat according to one Democrat. Uh, what did he say? You know, eat right. Eat, um, you know, uh, Chef Boyardee. That, that was the solution that they came up with. Uh, Joe Biden by generic raisin brand. I mean, think about how stupid and tone deaf this is. And if they don't pay tomorrow, I would be really surprised. I mean, you know the 1970s. We, we both are old enough to remember why there was a Reagan revolution with a massive wave of Republicans in 1980. And it was a lot of it was um, inflation. That's right. And history has not recorded that, but I remember it. And you're exactly right. So I guess we're going to thank you for that. <laughs> Anytime, Tucker. So no one really expected the governor's race in Arizona to become one of the most hotly contested, most closely covered races in the last 10 years, but that's what it is, thanks to Carrie Lake. And Carrie Lake is a huge threat because she comes out of the media. 30 years in the news media, she knows exactly how it works and she can explain it. So it probably shouldn't surprise you that her office was attacked recently, apparently, in a politically motivated attack. FBI, police, and bomb squads were called to her campaign headquarters in Phoenix over a suspicious piece of mail that contained white powder. So we still don't know what that powder is, and there's some debate over whether the FBI has even tested it. So to find out exactly what is going on in that story, we are proud to have Carrie Lake join us tonight. Carrie Lake, thanks so much for coming mm. on. So there are all kinds of versions of this story. What is the truth? Well, the truth is that we uh, had delivered at our office a couple of envelopes um, that had white powder in them. One of them, our employee, our staffer, opened up and immediately realized there was a problem with it, threw it in the garbage can, and then another staffer grabbed it from the garbage can, and then all of a sudden we had several people exposed to it. The police showed up, the bomb squad showed up, firefighters and the FBI, and they took the envelopes. There were a couple of them, at minimum, maybe more, and we were told they took them for testing. Now, this is the first time hearing that maybe they haven't so maybe you know more about it than I do I've been busy campaigning and we've just been monitoring our um, staffers health and so far so good but we are counting on the FBI to test that and let us know if we should be concerned about any danger apparently the contents of the letter were uh, incredibly um, you know vulgar and and threatening and so we, we take it as a, a legitimate threat but we're just happy that so far our staffers are okay how, since we're not in Arizona, we can't tell. What kind of coverage is this receiving in your media in the state? I did see it get some coverage. You know, I, I have not wanted to get much coverage out of this because, let's face it, I really would rather this be investigated and we find out who did it and catch the culprits. Right. But the real story is, I'll be honest, this is minor compared to what I'm going to go up against when I win this race. We are going to secure the border and take down the cartels at the border. I don't think letters, threatening letters are gonna be the worst of it. I think there's much more coming and we're ready for it. We will not be intimidated, Tucker. We've got big issues facing us. We have a border with narco terrorists in control. And while I'm upset that these letters were sent and I'm monitoring and care deeply about my staff, I know that there will be more threats to come and we will Stare them down because we will secure Arizona. They're Republican led border states that have done nothing to secure the border. So if you actually do that as governor of Arizona, you're going to get major pushback from the administration. Of course, we'll be covering it and rooting for you. Carrie Lake, thank you. Thank you. So here's a race that's gotten very little attention, at least from us. It's in the state of New Hampshire. It used to be a Republican state now, thanks to immigration from Boston. It's not. It's a mixed state, and its Senator Maggie Hassan was, of course, going to win. But then Don Bolduc showed up, and now he appears to be leading Maggie Hassan in some polls, which is amazing. How did that happen? 
Don Boldick joins us tonight. Thanks so much for coming on. Again, another race that I think very few people watching from outside New Hampshire expected to be competitive, and now by some measures you're winning. How would you do that? Well, Tucker, <clears throat> thank you for having me on, but it was just doing it the right way, grassroots way. Two years of campaigning, every town and city. We just finished our 83rd town hall between the primary and general election. We focused on message. When I started two years ago, we didn't have the economic issues, the inflation, the people struggling with heating and, and eating up here uh, in, in New England, you know, and appending black, blackouts and shortages of natural gas and diesel, already experiencing diesel shortages with some of the small businesses, and that's just terrible. So we, I transitioned with Granite Staters through this with two years of campaigning and went through it myself with high electric bills and high oil bills and high food bills. And I shared this with them. And by doing that, talking with them uh, and, and listening and learning from them, you know, we were able to, uh, you know, be able to relate. And Senator Hassan just hasn't done that. She's, she's hidden from them. She hasn't done any town halls. She does Zoom calls, uh, it, you know, to replace her her, you know, in-person appearances, and she brings people like Jill Biden and Cory Booker and, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren up here uh, to blow life in her flat campaign. Uh, and it just can't be done because they, that, those people are just an indicator to grand staters that it's status quo, more of the same, get ready for your misery index to get higher. So it's a moral imperative for her to get voted out of office so that we can go down there and fix this mess. She brought Cory Booker to New Hampshire. Wow. Talk about it. Yes, sir. Don Boldick, good luck tomorrow, truly. Thank you so much. God bless you, Tucker, and thank you for the opportunity to be on your show. God bless. So yet another whistleblower after Tony Bobulinski has come forward new details about the business dealings that Joe Biden was involved in while vice president. We've got details next. We're monitoring several campaign events on this election eve. On the left side of your screen, Governor of Florida Ron DeSantis speaking to supporters in Hialeah, Florida, in the southern part of the state. On the other side, on the right, Donald Trump in Dayton, Ohio, campaigning for J.D. Vance in that state's Senate race. We'll be right back. We've done several hour-long interviews on this show with a man called Tony Bobulinski. He was, now famously, Hunter Biden's business partner, and as such, he watched firsthand the Biden family's overseas influence peddling operation in progress. But he's not the only one who saw it. Now there is another whistleblower with firsthand information who is speaking. This person was on a conference call in 2012 as Joe Biden was president. That call included Joe and Hunter Biden, as well as Hunter Biden's business partner, Jeff Cooper, the late Senator Harry Reid and his son. The call was about obtaining an overseas license for a gaming company called Oco Global, which Hunter, Jeff, and, and Harry Reid's son were involved in. The DailyMail.com spoke to the whistleblower. Here's part of it. I was involved with Ocho. Um, there was a conference call I overheard incidentally. On that conference call were Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, Jeff Cooper, Harry Reid and Key Reid. The reason that they were talking about it is that this is an internet gaming and gambling company. What they were specifically talking about was, uh, you know, how the business development was happening. They were joyous that they had just uh, gotten an agreement tacitly with the government of Peru for a license. Um, the thing that was outstanding, you know, or obvious more than anything else is Joe Biden was directly involved in this business activity. He wasn't passive, he was talking about it. If I had to describe him, he was like a member of the board of directors. Maybe because of his prominent position, I would even describe him as the chairman of the board. So the sitting vice president is involved in a business deal for online gambling. Could it get sleazier? Josh Boswell is a senior reporter at Daily Mail. He joins us tonight. Josh, thanks so much for coming on. So just to be clear, the man in the video we just saw whose image and voice were obscured had direct firsthand knowledge of this. That's absolutely correct, yes. This whistleblower was on that conference call in 2012 when Joe Biden came on 
Harry Reid, the uh, then Senate Majority Leader, came on and Joe Biden was asking all these detailed questions about revenue projections for the company, uh, when the website would be live. He seemed very concerned, the whistleblower said, about what money they would be making from this company. And that's the Vice President of the United States. Well, that's a crime. That's a felony. The sitting vice president's not allowed to do that. No government official is. So is anybody, is the FBI following up on this? Do you know? Well, the whistleblower has tried to get this to law enforcement, to Congress. I, I've seen documents showing their outreach, uh, but nobody has uh, responded to them properly yet. And they have made themselves, um, uh, uh, they've notified um, the, the uh, senators who are investigating Hunter Biden. Um, so hopefully that will be followed up now. And I think the thing that may change um, after tomorrow is that there are a couple of committees that are going to have subpoena powers, and maybe that will really kickstart things in this particular part of the investigation. That's unbelievable. I mean, Biden would really have to sing a hymn in an abortion clinic to get the interest of the FBI, I think, at this point. Uh, Josh Boswell, thank you so much for your reporting, as, as always. Thank you. So we want to sum up exactly what we're looking at. So many races, not a presidential race, but governor's races, the entire House of Representatives, big chunk of the Senate. What does all of this add up to? What are we going to see tomorrow? Dana Perino is co-host of America's Newsroom and The Five. Spent her life around politics. Our friend <laughs> joins us tonight. Dana, great to see you. you. What do you think is going to happen tomorrow and why? Thank you. I think you'll see a culmination of what we have believed to be true since even uh, January 20th, 2021. What did we know then? One history tells us that the president's party almost always, historically, Tucker, loses seats in a midterm. Uh, the question is just how many seats. Let's look at the House, first of all. I think that the recruiting on the House Republican side has been really phenomenal. The number of different types of candidates that you'll see will be the most diverse class by far, and just some good quality individuals that have sometimes taken six to eight years to convince to run. I definitely think that you'll see the House turn to a Republican majority. Now to the Senate. I got to tell you, Tucker, we're hearing tonight even just some caution from Republicans saying, look, these races are very, very close. On the governor side of things, I think well, you just had Carrie Lake on. I think she's definitely going to win. And her candidate that she was running against was just terrible. So the Democrats will have a lot of thinking to do after the election results come in. We start tomorrow night at 6 p.m. We've got a great team, Tucker. It's going to be a good night. Uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, do you think... Because this is, as you said, part of like a long term cycle where, you know, we go one direction, then another the president's party always loses. Do you think it, it's a little over the top to be calling this a referendum on democracy itself since it's a recognizable pattern? Yes. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for picking up on that. That's exactly what I mean. Uh, indeed, I think that the Democrats, because they're so desperate, you know, they've ignored what the people have been telling them. They're worried about inflation, the economy, their jobs, crime, and they're mad about what happened to them during COVID on behalf of themselves and their businesses, but also on behalf of their children. This is the first election where they get to actually have their say after COVID. So you're going to see a lot of that. The Democrats That's are being right. so hyperbolic about the end of democracy when actually you have people that are turning. Out. I did this thing today on my one more thing in LaRon Singletary is Republican running in New York 25. He's challenging a Democratic incumbent and the refugees were up there. They're here legally. They were canvassing. They've never voted for a Democrat. I'm sorry, a Republican before. They're changing their mind. Why? Because of crime and education and inflation. Those are the three yeah. issues. That is democracy. This is democracy working, I would say. Uh, on real issues. Dana Prima, yeah, thank you for that I was excited to see that picture. Amen. Okay, take care. Thank you. See you tomorrow. So the President of the United States recognizes, well, lots at stake for him and his party, so he's out there trying to get out the vote. Not surprisingly, not going very well. We have the video evidence. It's sad but necessary. We'll show it to you next. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the deal. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the deal. Gays and gentlemen, here's the deal. That was the president last Tuesday. His messaging has not gotten better. Yesterday in Yonkers, New York, Biden nearly fell over while campaigning for the unelected governor, Kathy Hochul. We put a cap of $2,000 a year on prescription drugs for seniors, no matter what their cost. Two, 10, 12, 15. Oops, stepping on them. There's a, it's black. Anyway. <laughs> Make it end. 
Here's some good news on the way out. We told you last week about two leaders of the group True the Vote, one of whom we know well, Catherine Engelbrecht and Greg Phillips. They were thrown in jail back on Halloween. What did they do? They burned down a Wendy's? No, that's not a crime. They, they made a real crime, actually. They broke the law. They made allegations about voter fraud in American elections and then refused to reveal to a court their source, which they thought was constitutionally protected. Turns out, no, they went to jail. Well, today, a federal appeals court reversed the decision and sprung them from behind bars. Godspeed to them both. Always note justice when it appears. Well, our final show before Election Day is over. We'll be back during Fox's election coverage for a bit tomorrow. That coverage starts at 6 p.m. Eastern on the Fox News channel. We recommend it highly. It's going to be an interesting night. Here's Sean Hannity.